My guests and I explore all aspects of what it takes to create, write, publish, and promote your ideas. Whether you are a novelist, scriptwriter, songwriter, or dream of writing for newspapers and magazines, we will help guide and inspire you to achieve your goals as an accomplished writer. That's Aspects of Writing every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock p.m. here on KLAV. And remember, if you can dream it, you can write it. Welcome to Aspects of Writing with your host, James Kelly. For the next 60 minutes, we'll explore every aspect of writing, including how to create, format, and even sell your work. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230 or toll-free. 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's get right. Here's your host, James Kelly. Hello and welcome to Aspects of Writing here on KLAV. I am your host, James Kelly. And on your computer, you can listen to this podcast live at www.klav1230am.com. We are also broadcasting live on youtube.com forward slash aspects of writing. Uh, the topic of today's show is writing conversationally. And my guest for today's show, which still have not called in, so we're waiting, are authors Dr. Elspeth Muth and Freddie Zintal Weaver, along with my co-hosts Janet Corsi and Dana Michelli. Uh, Dr. Elspeth Muth and Freddie Zintal Weaver are the authors of Sexual Enlightenment. Uh, Dr. Elspeth Muth and Freddie are, uh, offer a roadmap that can alter and enlighten the way you look at sexual energy, love, and your uh, conscious self. But first, my panel and I like, would like to read a few fun quotes about writing. And I guess we're going to start with uh, Jan. Would you like to take the first one? Sure. A writer is someone for whom writing is more difficult than it is for other people. Thomas Mann. <laughs> Thomas Mann. <laughs> How about the second one as well? Since <laughs> <laughs> Which of us has not felt like the characters we are reading in the printed page is more real than the people standing right beside us? Cornell Fuke. A uh, great writer reveals the truth even when he or she does not wish to, and that's Tom, Tom Bizzle. A uh, critic is a man who knows the way but can't drive the car. <laughs> that's <laughs> Kenneth Zanin. And I'll let you take number five. You know how writers are. They create themselves as they create their work. Or perhaps they create their work in order to create themselves. <sighs> Orson Scott Card. All right. If you are just tuning in, you are listening to Aspects of Writing with me, your host, James Kelly, here on KLAV. On your computer, you can listen to this broadcast live at KLAV, w, I'm sorry, www.klav1230am.com. Again, my guests on the show today are authors um, Dr. Elsbeth Muth and Freddie Zintal Weaver, along with my co-host in the studio, Janet Corsi, and hopefully Dana Michelle will be calling in from New York. Um, I'm not sure if our phone lines are open or what's going on there. Um, before I introduce my guest, let's go to Janet Corsi for a little segment we call Jan's Corner. Well, James, I've been reading and reading and reading, and now I understand it. I'm hooked, and I have a chance at being much better writer for it. I see how others are weaving their stories, how they bring their characters to life, and made me a reader that could feel. Yes. That is the goal. Get under the skin of the reader. Beat up the bad guy. Win the lottery. Marry that perfect person that at the beginning we loathed. Make them open up and allow the reader to enjoy the outlet they're reaching for and searching for. The goal we are after as writers is to make the reader feel what the character is feeling. That's the bonus. We as writers want the reader to fly with or without assistance. Dive to the deepest of the oceans. Feel what it's like to be kidnapped. How it feels to be a bank robber. Uh, how to demand respect or just get a laugh. Okay, then. It's back to my computer for me. I've got so many ideas. I don't know how I'm going to handle it all. But I do know this. One word at a time, it'll all come together. And thus, I am even writing whimsical nonsense just for myself. Just to loosen up as a writer. I'm having a ball. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes that's the best thing to do. You just write for yourself sometimes. Um, I have so many story ideas that tucked away you wouldn't believe. So, I, And it does help you when you get ready to do something else. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it's just its so much fun. I, I had no idea it would ever be. Well, again, you are listening to Aspects of Writing with me, your host, James Kelly. Um, we are live on, on the radio at 1230am.com. Or twelve three a.m. on the radio, <laughs> and www.klav1230am.com on the computer. 
Um, we're still waiting for Dr. Els Elsbeth Muth and Freddie Zental. We were to call in. Uh, Dana did join us. So, Dana, how are you today? Sorry, I was having te technical difficulties. Oh. <laughs> Yes, but I am here now. Uh, you don't even want to know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it later. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, um, we're, we're going to be talking today about writing conversationally. And w until our guests arrive, we're just going to skip right to that part of the program. Um, and Dana, you know, you and I are working on a project right now, and I kind of feel like without realizing it, we're kind of doing that with this, com with this book, um, yes. Angels Never Die. Uh, do you agree or? Absolutely. Um, if you if you have a problem hearing me, let me know because I don't know what's going on. But um, okay, you're you're great right now. <laughs> okay, good, good. Uh, I it's I definitely feel that way because it's such a personal story and it's a very down to earth story. And like the purpose is for everyone to be able to relate to it. So I feel like it is very conversational. And it's know? actually and, yeah, it's kind of told from from Gwen McNutt's vantage point, like. She, she yeah. is the mother of these four boys who died, and, and she writes this book based on her experience with that. Right. Mm -hmm. So writing conversationally is sort of a way of, of really just writing the way you hear it or see it, you know, whatever you, the way you would normally. You're writing what you're telling. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're, I mean, she's telling us a story. Yeah, my, my opinion of it is that you want to feel like you're, um, you, like when it's speaking to you, like you're just sitting around and, and hearing her, like if she was giving a speech or, you know, sitting in your living room, something very, you know, that people can relate to because what she went through was just, I mean, any parent would hear that and just, you know, cringe just, and oh. how she's come through it all. So, you know, one thing that's interesting, um, cause I am doing the structural part of this editing, and Dana is doing the proofing and, and the final editing. And um, I sent you some some work last night, Dana. Um, the rest yeah. of the story, actually. And there was one interesting thing in there. What I did not know until I got to a, spe a specific chapter is that she actually, after the death of the first or second child, she started keeping a journal. Mm -hmm. um, she was so distraught over what was happening, she just decided, "I'm going to write this down." So I think writing conversationally has a little bit to do with that as well. It's actually writing down what your feelings were, the way you thought at the time, um, and what was said, really. I mean, there was a lot of quotes in there that the kids, the all four boys said that she actually wrote yeah. down. So that's writing conversationally, I believe. I would think that yeah. I would do it, yeah. yeah. Uh, the w little bits that I've read, um, what I like is she's so truthful. I mean, she tells us things that we don't, you know, we don't have to hear, but when we hear it, it makes her more human, makes everything she's about to tell us more acceptable because she's really laying herself out there. It, it's just, you know, uh, I can't wait to read it all. <laughs> yeah, Dana, I, just, I printed out the, f I actually finished your editing up to chapter nine, and then mm -hmm. I printed that out for Jan to, to read to give us her feedback on it. So. Oh, that's great. Yeah, great. yeah. Um, I think when you start finishing the rest of this dating, you're going to just be amazed at how <coughs> this comes together. I'm, I, I'm really proud of this book. It's really a good book. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I just, I just can't believe every time I read it, I can't believe or you and I talk about it, that she lived through that. And, and if you speak to Gwen, you, she has such a good attitude mm -hmm. that you think, Always most jolly. Would just not be able to function, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think she speaks to that in her, in her very first paragraph when she talks about mm -hmm. faith. Yeah. Well, we're going to open the phone lines up today for anyone who would like to call in to talk about conversational writing, and the local number is area code seven zero two seven three one one two three zero. Long distance, or if you want a toll free number, it's eight six six eight two zero five five two eight. Feel free to call in. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna we're gonna skip to the fourth page of our, our script, and we're, we always script our show, and we're gonna talk about what is conversational writing. So, Dana, I'm gonna let you start with that if you don't mind reading um, what is conversational writing. Okay, let me. Let me <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! Yeah. Uh, I'm totally discombobulated today. What All right, how about if I do that, writing? and then we'll switch it uh, around a little bit? I mean, I'm here. Okay. Is that how you say it? Yeah, Squidoo. Uh-huh. 
According to Twitter.com, conversational writing means writing the way you talk. Well, almost. You're writing the way you talk if you trimmed out all the pauses, stumblings, uhs, and you knows. Hardly anyone speaks perfectly. I sure don't. Um, conversational writing isn't just an, isn't an excuse to write sloppily, though. It just means writing in a clear, concise way that anyone can understand. Writing in a conversational way means connecting with young readers. It's about trying to give them a reason to care about what you have to say, and it's about being genuine. And that's what we're talking about. Even when I was talking to um, someone else I know today about writing conversationally, and basically I think most memoirs are written in that fashion. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's writing about what you know, and, and it's being genuine to what mm -hmm. really happened in your life. So, well, you can tell in this first paragraph of Gwen's book, that's how she's talking. She's, she's telling you mm -hmm. the story. Uh, and I hate to call it a story. She's telling her life. Yeah. Right. And you're going to find, by the way, Jen, that she holds nothing back. Yeah. She, she tells you what they went through. And, and Dana, you're, you're going to find a little more of this later on as well, um, how they gave up on their faith and they right. went their honky-tonking. and. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and I could see that happening with me like day one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, because it's, I think I think that I mean, if that's the way her story went, that they never lost faith, then that would be honest and that's great. But I think it's very relatable because the tragedy that she went through was so enormous that I don't know who wouldn't lose faith. You know what I mean? You'd have to be, you know, Mother Teresa, maybe. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I think it's very human how she and her husband handled it. Well, we're going to premise this story because we're going to use this as an example for what we're talking about today. Her story is, is called um, Angels Never Die, and, and it's about her four boys that all had two different rare blood diseases, Fanconi anemia and West, Col Wil West Scott Wilcox disease, I believe, was the second one. Is that right, Dana? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Judy. And so anyway, that's that's what her story is about. And she watched these boys die one by one. You know, one died at like 7, one eleven, 11, 115, and the last one died at age 19. And so there's so much truth in this story about what she felt, you know, how how you feel about the, the how she strived to maintain her family and friends. Um, there's one point in there where she felt like committing suicide, locked herself in a closet. I mean, all these things that you would emotionally go through on a journey like this. And then coming out on the end and realizing there's a purpose for everything. And instead of hating God or, or anyone else, she embraced what happened as if this was my test. This is what I have to go through as a mother. We always talk about how, how difficult it is for a mother to, or a father to lose the child first. But I think, we, actually Gwen and I were talking about this last night. I think that actually it, it can be either way. Because think about a child who loses their parent. Yeah. And to me that's mm -hmm. just as difficult as a parent losing their child. We're mm -hmm. so attached that you're devastated when this happened. A part of you dies with it. You know, right. whomever dies. So, um, that, so that's what this book is about. It's about connecting and, and accepting death, really, and yeah. understanding that it's part of life. And she did such a great job in writing this as far as being so honest with everything. Now, yeah. we have Judy McFadden who has joined us online. Judy, how are you? I'm doing fine, James. I was going to tune in for your guest today because I... I'm into yoga, not uh, hatha yoga, not tantric yoga. So um, I had planned to call in. Oh, so okay. I thought I'd call I'd call in earlier since um, I don't know if they're there online yet. Well, I don't think they are. I did speak with Elspeth yesterday and the day before, so maybe they got their times mixed up because they are in a different time zone. Um, yes. I did just send you a text. Tell so. me about it. Well, Tell you me have, about we, that. We also have to keep in consideration a weather factor back there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. could be Jen, down lines. Jen, Jen, if you want to know a weather factor, <laughs> when I opened the blinds and looked out at my thermometer on the deck this morning, it was 12 degrees below zero. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, goodness. And you live in Florida, yeah. right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. The northern, the northern part of Florida. Uh, actually, and you're in the... the now that wasn't with the wind chill. Yeah. Oh. You're in the same time zone they are, as a matter of fact. So, Where are they um, calling from? Or, it's somewhere in the Midwest, somewhere around Ohio, I believe. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. But it, so, I, 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 I'm sure that happened, James, because yeah. it happens with me. You yeah. get confused. 
Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, she hasn't answered, answered my text back either. So I find that kind of odd. So I'm thinking they're probably having some problem with the phone lines. Very possible. So, yeah. 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 So, but we're going to handle this anyway. We're going to talk about writing conversationally. And actually, I'm glad you called Judy because you kind of did that with your book. Is that correct? I did. I did. I did. Yeah. I really did. One, one of the things is, uh, is to try to write the way you talk. That's what voice is. In writing, when, you know, you use voice. And I've had so many people tell me after reading the book that um, they felt like I was, I was talking to them. And that's what that's what you strive for. You yeah. want to make it conversational. Right. Um, one of the things that I'm curious about when we're, when we're talking about writing conversationally, Dana, when when the author is writing conversationally, they're basically writing as they're telling the story, mm -hmm. and they're giving quotes and things. But when it comes to the narrative, should that also maintain that same structure or? Um, I could only speak to, I mean, because I, I usually, when I go to write books, it's usually a memoir. Mm -hmm. And the ones I've written, yes, they, they yes, maintain the yes. person's voice okay. throughout. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to read another part of this here. Actually, Jan, if you would. Um, <coughs> you're right. Yeah. <laughs> did, I, did I read too much before? I think, no. Did I hog that whole thing? <laughs> no, 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 no. You were supposed to. Thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate that. You did beautifully. <laughs> Use contractions. <laughs> you'll sound you'll sound like a normal person if you say don't and won't. Use I and you. You don't have to, but it makes your writing more personal. It's like you're really talking to the reader. And I've been told never to do that. Well, I think it depends on what kind of book it is in the structure. Like if you're doing mm -hmm. a narrative, you wouldn't necessarily do that. Um, well, fortunately, I had a very good editor that let me do it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I do notice that Dana does do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the contractions. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and see, I'm the opposite. I, I don't like contractions. I, I don't know why. Yeah. Um, but when, it depends but when you it talk, is. James, when you talk, James, you don't say, I do not like, I, you say don't and won't when you talk. Right. I do? <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding, you guys. Yes, of course I do. Um, okay, and Dana, would you like to take the next one? Four, uh, don't be wordy. Say what needs to be said. Don't ramble or fill your sentences with unnecessary words. Don't use $5 words. I can't even say what that is. <laughs> I can't even. It's some long for you listeners out there. It's like has twenty letters to it, and I can't pronounce. Easily, yeah. It means, means <laughs> physically beautiful, but it sounds like something you vomit. Multitudinous. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, the thing is, is that basically they're saying you want to use words people understand. You know, you're, you're trying to keep it light, um, and people don't use words like that normally right. speaking I mean if they do half the time I can't understand those people anyway so <laughs> uh, I'm gonna read the next one don't use the passive voice this really muddles things up a decisive but reached a decision it was reached is a limp noodle compared to I made a decision and you know I'm very I'm really guilty of that I'm always writing in the passive voice and I know Dana you know that so <laughs> <laughs> I've done it too. Sometimes it just makes sense. I mean, I try to kind of feel it out, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I, for instance, we'll go back to Gwen's book. I think it's so important for her. She uses the passive voice all the time, but mm -hmm. it's because she's putting that behind her, and, and it is the past for her. So I think it's appropriate right. at, at, at points to mm -hmm. do that. Right. Yeah. Sometimes it just sometimes it just makes more sense. Like you know, if you need to like know the rules to know how to break them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Sometimes. Oh. That makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Well, now we're going to go into now. Here are a few tips for writing conversationally. And Judy, I wish you had a list. I'd have you read some of these. But Jan, <laughs> <you're> here. <laughs> hey, Jan, I'm really. I can excited. make up one. I can make up one. <laughs> we'll let you do that in a minute. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Ask yourself if what you wrote sounds like something you'd say out loud. If your writing is filled with words that won't come naturally to you in a conversation, it probably needs some changes. 
I write stuff, and then when I go to read it, I can't read it. But that's yeah. how I said it in my yeah. head. Yeah, if you're you know, giving speeches, if you're giving speeches, if you're, you do public speaking, mm -hmm. you read through your speech, and there's certain parts that you just you, you can't wrap the, your lips around. You yeah, know, just, you, you take those out because there's it, it doesn't go smoothly. There's certain, and, and it's a personal thing. I think I don't think everybody would have the same problem with the same part, but there are parts, and you you take those out. Yeah, and you know, talking about speaking and probably needs some changes. Uh, <laughs> um, when I write, even for our show, I write for the show. Um, I do the same thing. Sometimes I'll find myself talking out loud because I'm thinking, does that sound mm -hmm. right? So I yeah. want to make sure it's going to sound okay on the air. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And even yeah, with you, you should do that. I, I always read Jan's too, and I have little suggestions mm -hmm. here. Because we are thinking one thing, and when we put it on paper, we're putting what we're thinking. But then we're not reading it out loud. We're not saying it. Right. And sometimes right. you have to say it to understand what you're trying to convey. That's why I always say make, sense. make all the changes you so desire. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll read the next one as well. Say less, not more. It's better to start your first draft by saying more than necessary than cut out all the fluff. I understand mm. that. Well, I understand but that. Jan, Jan, that's kill the baby. That is kill the baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Yeah. Because sometimes you want to have more so you can pick out the good parts and make sure that, you know, you want to convey your message. And sometimes you have to get a little wordy to get it on paper. Yeah. But then you don't want it too long for the reader. So you right. have to, you know, narrow it down. Yeah. But my problem is, uh, and it really wasn't, you know, Thing that kept me in line. I would write something I really thought was sharp, and and then it would just disappear. It was the baby that got thrown out with the bath water. And I, thought, I really liked that piece. <laughs> yeah. That baby was dead. That yeah. baby went out quick. Yeah, baby got you. No, I say save, save the baby, put it aside, and use it later. Don't throw the baby away. <laughs> Oh, well, that's, that, that's very true. That's a good idea. That's a good idea to do that. And we have a surprise, ge a surprise guest who just walked into the studio. So we're going to let him pick up a microphone and put on a headset. And this is truly a surprise guest. This is truly a surprise guest. Uh, we had no idea this person was even going to walk in the studio today. So why don't you say hello to, for us? I didn't uh, think, uh, Jimmy, I was coming in either, but I'm drunk, so it doesn't matter. And oh. once again, once again, once again in the studio, we have Ying and Yang. <laughs> is that Ying on the phone? Jan Judy is on the phone. Hi, Judy. Uh, hi, Yang. How are you? I didn't know you were going to be there. I didn't either. I'm going, uh, I'm as a guest on uh, the old net uh, radio thing with Al Jensen. Oh. Yeah, that's cool. coming up at three, and I'm wandering the hallways, you know, looking for some love. <laughs> Yeah, he, he looked through our, 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 our window, and I wait for him to come on in. So. That was a surprise. I didn't know. I forgot you guys this were on this time. This is most certainly a surprise show. <laughs> Hi, Janet. Our How are you? Our schedule guest didn't show up. Oh, great. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to talk. Oh, by the way, this is Destiny. Destiny helps us out here in the studio. She's Hi, uh, in college and working with us. Great. So. Good. Um, Jan, I'm going to let you take this next one here. Well, where did you already say that? I don't know. Oh, simple is beautiful. Try to make things as clear and easy to understand as possible. Ah, Makes sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, Dana, any comments on this? Um, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, more words. <laughs> I could have said that. <laughs> um, I think generally I agree. I've also read mostly... You know, when it comes to novels, I've read descriptions that are very long and drawn out, but they're beautiful. And I read a book recently, I, I reviewed a book recently, um, and it's coming out March 15th. It's called American Sycamore, and the author's name is Karen Fielding. She lives in England. Um, I'm not sure if she's an expat or if she is English, or, but the book, her descriptions are absolutely beautiful. You feel like you're there. Yeah. And, but they're lengthy. I mean, sometimes they get into it. You know what I mean? They're very, it's about a lot of nature, being out in nature and stuff like that. And you feel like you're there. And um, Alice Hoffman's there, um, like that, that book, um, and she write Practical Magic, and she's written a lot of books that are like that. Um, and Joyce Carroll owes to some extent in life. They all write very long descriptions, but they, it works for them. So and I agree for the most part, but... 
Well, I have something that's interesting here. I didn't realize this until, again, I'm looking at Don. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. and you know what's interesting is, is that Don was the director for 40 years in Hollywood, and he read many, 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 many television scripts. So if anyone knows about writing conversationally, I would think Don would know a little bit about that. Gee, I'm on the spot here. What am I supposed to say? <laughs> yeah, that's what our topic today is, is writing conversationally. Oh. I wasn't sure what that was until I started researching it and didn't realize all along I, a lot of times I'm writing that way. Well, you're talking that way. Well, I always talk that way. Well, of course, and that's how you write. Yeah. I mean, you take a conversation. At least I believe you take a conversation between, say, you and Janet, which you do on your show, mm -hmm. and it comes off very conversational. Mm -hmm. So when you're writing... Uh, I think you have to have the character of Janet and yourself in mind if you are the prototypes so you know how she speaks because you know her or if you're writing fictional and you make her up then you have to write as if you were her mm -hmm. so you step into her shoes right. and then you fill back what she would say to you whether it's uh, in the vernacular or, or the custom of her speaking and yours and that's how you just develop it and of course, I always feel that writing is rewriting. Right. So you'll go back and you'll touch it up. You'll say, well, wait a minute. I don't think she would say it that way. You put, take out a couple of words and all of a sudden it starts to flow. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of neat to be talking about this today because I think we do this all the time and don't even realize it. And Dana, um, I know you haven't written any, any scripts or edited any scripts. I don't think, have you? Um. I turned one script into a novel. Oh, wow. Okay. So that, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. I, I did that. It. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Great, it's a great resource. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do that. I actually write most of my work is written as a script first, and then I transpose yeah. it into novel format. And you open it up. Oh. Yeah. It's well, fun. Yeah, you find out uh, your characters, then you have to build. Mm -hmm. So what goes from a 120-page uh, script turns into... A 400-page novel, yeah, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, because what's interesting is, is that in writing, and, and script is really written conversationally. Now that we're talking about this, it should be <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times, it's not narrative, but most of it is written conversationally. So that's what's interesting as well is that when you're writing a script, you are writing conversationally. Um, and what's different between writing for uh, for a script, though, as opposed to a novel, is, is you have to embellish that script. Because the script's written for the director to direct and, and create in his mind what he wants to visually see. Whereas in a novel, you have to paint that picture. Mm -hmm. And that's the difficulty of it between the two. I found that when I was uh, directing television shows, uh, you have to forgive me, my voice is fairly shot, so it doesn't sound like me. <laughs> Ying, is it me? Yes, it's you, Yang. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sweetie. Uh, it is uh, it's very difficult uh, in a novel to paint the picture sometimes, mm -hmm. but on television, you better paint it quickly because it's it's on the screen. Mm -hmm. So the writers that I used to work with would say to me, or would say to themselves, uh, we're coming to a passage here where we want to have some direction. Uh, let's have him uh, cross down the stairs and do all this kind of stuff. And finally, they got tired of that because I had worked so long on the show. They said, "Let Barnhart do it, because we'll just, you know, we'll just have a direction here. They go up the stairs and let him figure out the comedy stuff on camera." Mm -hmm. Well, that gave me a great leeway to yeah. paint the picture uh, that they were trying to get across, and then I could, of course, embellish it. So basically, you were just getting the conversation. Well, I was writing it on camera. Mm -hmm. Camera was the writer or the pen. Mm -hmm. or the computer, and I was just the instrument to get it to do uh, what I can get the actors to do because of it. So there was no script writing involved at all in that. Mm -hmm. They just gave it to me to do, which I found it very freedom, and a lot of freedom and very uh, uh, a very nice way to work because mm -hmm. I didn't have to ask questions about, should I do this? Should I? I just did it, and it either worked or it didn't. Mm -hmm. And if it didn't work, then we fix it. But that's rehearsal, you know, and then... And the good thing is, is that in, you were on Saved by the Bell for seven years, eight years? Eight years. Eight years. So you, you knew the actors. So you, you actually knew their characters so well. They were like real, I'm sure. Well, when you're writing a script, though, when you're starting out writing, you don't know that. But the trick is, I found, one of the great tricks of writing a comedy half hour is you pick the one that you like. 
whatever show it is that you like that's still on the air, that's going to be on the air for another year or two, at least that. And you study that show. Now, it used to be the old days when you'd write cheers. You'd write a copy of that, send it in. They would look at it, and then would go, oh, he knows the characters pretty well. Well, what happens is you spend a few weeks memorizing and finding out what the characters do. Then you just write a story. Story is in your mind. The story works for me. Okay, so what is Ted Danson going to do here? Or what is so-and-so going to do there? And you write that story based on their characters, and you may get a good shot at, at, at selling your script that way, as opposed to writing for a show that nobody knows about. Mm -hmm. First or second time out, nobody knows. So how do you? You, know, you, don't, you have no answers for that. Mm -hmm. So you pick a show that's going to be on, and maybe you get a shot at it mm -hmm. if the story's good. So now, Judy, you were going to say something a while ago. What were you going to add? Um, I, I'm just flabbergasted that Yang is there. <laughs> I'm not able to, to, to respond. I mean, I'm in shock because I didn't think that, that w the team would be together again. No, yeah. sure. <laughs> and you know, Judy just called in. We, it was not planned for her to be on the oh, show. Oh, she was a surprise. She, yeah. She well, so what I do... Well, honey, what I do is I just go from studio to studio all day long, and I look in the window, and if they wave me in, I come in and whack. If they don't, then I'm on, you know, I go home. <laughs> what a fantastic idea. That's a good way to get, you know, recognition out there. Well, get your it, name out there. Well, it worked for me for you. Yes, it, <laughs> it did. <laughs> uh, can, can I ask Don a question? Oh, of course. How did classes go? Classes went well. I was very surprised. I'll tell you just a quick story because I don't want to interrupt your flow here. Uh, but when I first uh, said I was going to do the uh, college classes right. in television production, uh, I called up to find out how many people were involved. And they said, well, so far only two signed up. And I went, two? And I went home and I started to laugh because I was worried about what I was going to wear on the first day. <laughs> <laughs> and just two. And so I was in the shower and my dog Jack, who is a lovely poodle, was sitting in a chair that a guy bought me in the shower. Now why he watches me take a shower, I have no clue. <laughs> but, anyway, but, it, but I'm in there and I'm laughing, uh, obviously with no clothes on and you know, drenched with... Uh, shower water and I started to laugh because I and this is crazy I'm going to worry about what I'm going to wear on the first day of school anyway <laughs> you hadn't been there in years no <laughs> you know and so and so what happened was it turned out I had nine students and it worked Fantastic. out yeah and it worked out pretty well and, and the first class was I hope uh, was enlightening to them I wanted to pass on you know a number of years I can't imagine it not being well uh, you know I'm sure I, uh, uh, well, it, it turned out pretty well. The second one last week was fabulous. I even got some thumbs up. All right. From there. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm looking forward to the third one coming up this coming Saturday at CSN. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, what is it that you're, you're teaching? Uh, television uh, production. Mm -hmm. So I, I uh, advertised on Facebook and so forth that uh, it was for actors, directors, writers, and editors. Mm -hmm. what, what the editor can do to an actor, either make them or break them. Yeah, and if the actor is a jerk, sometimes that the uh, the editor will complain about it because the actor was not consistent, uh, didn't do the same things every time. It caused the editor to have no uh, amount of problems, and he may say that to the producer: "This person, actor, male, female, is terrible to work with." It took me three extra hours to edit the piece. And the producer will say, mm, mm, I see, and we'll hire him back. Right. I mean, it's just that simple. Mm -hmm. Whereas the editor could make that person really stand out yeah. and, and look great. You know? So they're very important. Well, they're the key. I love editing. Editing is a final touch. Yeah. And you can act, you can direct, you can write all you want to, but if that edit doesn't come out to make the story, which is paramount, make the story work, uh, then you've got a problem. You know, my job is to interpret the story and to get the actors to be in the same ballpark. And I think as a director, my job is to make people comfortable, make them so that they can come out of themselves, be, be play-like, 
and enjoy the, the process, you know. So. And you know, a parallel to that is in book writing. Yes. Because we are, we are the creators, we're the writers, and we're the director. And then we hire the editor <laughs> to make sure that voice is heard. Let me ask you a question about that. You just said to hire an editor. I have four novels that I wrote. Correct. You know that. Uh, however, when I look back at them on occasion, I find there are some grammatical errors. Mm -hmm. There are some uh, you know, punctuation and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, well, if I hire an uh, editor, mm -hmm. I don't want to touch the content. The content is mine. Right. However, I realize it has to be updated and it's been self-published and so forth. So I'm pretty much ready to send it out to anybody. It's on Amazon and Kindle. I don't mean to plug myself, but heck, I'm here. Right. So I'm just, May as well. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we don't mind. we got to fill time. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm a time killer. I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I am, too. I'm fine. <laughs> and I won't take your spot to you called in, and I will get off here pretty quick. Uh, but I wanted to say I, that they don't want you to. They don't want you to. She don't want you to. We're needed. Oh. We're needed, Neil. We're needed. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're oh, needed. Well, that's right. Anyway, let me get to my final point before I forget it because my memory is absolutely shot nowadays. <laughs> but but, but, but uh, where was I? Oh, uh, yeah, editors. If, you, if I, my my dream is this, Jim. Yeah. Is that and Janet? I don't want to cut that out because you're swell. <laughs> But, yes, uh, I read you on Facebook. Yes. Well, uh, you do comment. I, I do. Uh, the, the thing was, I'm asking you, Jim, is is it smart to leave them alone as they are? And then, if, the, if somebody's interested, say, my dream is to have Paramount or Sony or Columbia Pictures, you know, those people, to, 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 to read one, because I know they have readers out mm -hmm. there, right. to read one of them and say, you know, we really like this. And we're going to make it into a movie. Oh. But, you know, everything I've seen and read about that process is if they take a... Actually, I had someone who took my first novel with Creative Arts Agency mm -hmm. and was going to represent that to producers and directors. They, they picked that book apart. That has to read well. It has to read well in order to get their attention. Um, well, I'm, in, I'm, co I'm confident, Jim, that it does. Okay. It reads well. Okay. The action is there. The... The adult themes are there, the comedy is there, but but I'm a little bit apprehensive about my own abilities to be judgmental on my grammatical or punctuation. And, and that's why you need someone to do the proofreading. I mean, every all of us do that. I mean, mm -hmm. I think I have a friend who went after a PhD. I think I've told this story before, and it was in English, and he hired an editor. Because you're so close to your dissertation, you can't see your mistakes. You can't see right. it. You, no. you cannot edit right. your own. You can't edit your own work. And let me just interject something. You shouldn't have given uh, your your manuscript to to an editor or several and still find uh, errors in it. Correct. That's what you're yeah. paying them for. Then now, if you do, if you give it to a college uh, classmate, you know, and who's pretty good in English, and you ask them to do it. That's one thing, but a professional editor should you should not have any type of um, uh, grammatical or spelling errors. I had my book edited four times. Mm -hmm. I had it edited before it went to the printer. But you mm -hmm. probably still found a couple of errors, I'm sure, even after no. the printing. No? No. Oh, no. You're good. You're not, good. One. Uh, no, not one. Well, I've, but I've seen errors. In professional published books. Yes, I have. Yes, I have too. I have. Too. And you say, well, what happened there? I mean, so it doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm, I'm playing the crapshoot. But what you want to do is narrow it down to where they're not noticeable. As clean as the possible. average reader doesn't read the small words like the or the or if a comma is missing. They don't pay attention to well, that. Well, that's what they do in, in movies too. They don't pay attention to the, uh, the the uh, the edited right. version. You know, where they have a jump cut or something like that, or a boom is in the picture. Uh, listen, Jim, I have to go see Al, because I'm on the other way. Well, I'm, on, I'm, I'm, I'm going from Oscar studio to that show. Stay on this one. But I, studio Hopper. Well, oh, no. I, I'm, just a, I'm just a horror. I, I, <laughs> but the point, the point being, I, got, I wanted to say something to you, Jim. I said this on Facebook, but I love your uh, posts when you talk about famous writers and the stuff yeah. they have gone through. Uh, but whatever you're doing uh, to do that, I, I love that because it it, it kind of gives you a little hope 
a little bit about what they've gone through back in the 18 and 1900s mm-hmm. about how they wrote and the stuff that they had to, you know, so I'm now, and I want to say thank you for that. I appreciate oh, it. thank you. But I wanted to say to you, since most of them were drunks, I'm going to go and have a drink, <laughs> and I'm going to go talk to Al and, uh, and, and Yak on the radio. Ying, I'll, I'll talk to you later, honey. Okay. Bye. Go, go Thanks, Don. Thanks, Thanks for stopping Thanks, by. We appreciate it. Oh, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, hey, James, your show turned out well. Hey, hey, I know. Thank you, Don. All right. Well, Don, we'll have to have you back on. I might have you on next week because we're going to do a reunion show. Yeah. Next week is our two-year anniversary, or in two weeks is our two-year anniversary on the air. All right. I'll do that. Thank you. So, Judy, I'll probably want you back on in two weeks as well. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. yeah. Get in touch with me. Well, I think... I think I- I think your guest, I, I really believe, if it, if it does not have anything to do with the weather, although they could be, they could call in from their home, mm-hmm. um, it, it's, it's, I know what happened. I know what happened. It's a time you, you get, you get confused. Well, I've done it. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's easy to get confused, um, but it texts her. But, you know, I'm sure it's more than likely what Jam was saying has something to do with the weather, because... We had a great conversation yesterday, so well, you know, they were excited. possibly out going from one place to another. They got stuck well, but, oh, where that one place true. is yeah. because yeah. of the that weather. That would be fun. That uh, would be fun. Yeah. No, it's almost impossible. We've, we've, uh, I've got a snow drift up against the house, like about five, maybe five feet up against the house. And <sighs> it's, um, it's, it's unbelievable. I, I, I can't tell you how cold it is. And the wind was like 15 miles an hour the other night and blowing the snow around. The people, you, you, you can't see. There's whiteout conditions on the road. It's awful. Well, if, if they, you know, when Elspeth calls me, we'll reschedule to have them back on. I'm sure they have a valid reason for not calling in. Yeah. Um, I would like to say that you are listening to Aspects of Writing with me, your host, James Kelly. My co-hosts are Dana Michelle and Janet Corsi. And then we have Judy McFad, who's joined us from Ohio. Um, and we are talking about conversational writing today. And then we have Destiny, who's here. She's the one who does all my posts for me on Facebook. And then Tim at the board. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to say, now I, I watched some of uh, Elspeth's and, and Freddie on um, some clips, some uh, YouTube clips. Our guest. Uh, I did, our, I did our, too, Jan. Oh, you did? Okay. Mm-hmm, I and did too. What I liked about the way she talked was it wasn't like she was talking down to anybody or even introducing right. something new. But more or less saying, look at this is this is how you open up to life, and this right. is you know it's just smooth. Just uh, her whole entrance into everything is just smooth. It's very conversational. Mm-hmm. It's just yeah. uh, just flows. And I thought, oh, you she's very interesting to watch. Both of them were. Both of them yeah. talked very. I, I just I like listening to them. You know, it's. Uh, yeah, well, I can't wait till we talk to him. Did you see the clip where he was performing? No. He's a performer. He he does like a one man show. I was reading yeah. about it. Yeah. He drums. He sings. Uh, it, you know, he does little improvs, um, and the people just love it. I mean, they interviewed people afterward, and they just loved it. So he's very talented, uh, as well as you know, into into what he's doing. But he's he's a performer too. Well. Um, just so we know, the the listeners know, we're, we're talking about sexual enlightenment. That's the book that Dr. Ellsworth, um, Muth wrote, and Freddie Zantal, yeah, um, Weaver. And uh, one of the things I want to talk about as well, I, I'm just curious as to exactly what they're talking about here, Dana. And it was it was something for you to read, but I'm going to read it. Leave the thar- lathar- leave the thesaurus alone. <laughs> Don't use it if you're just looking for a fancy word. Consult the thesaurus during those moments when you honestly can't think of the right word. Uh, because I know we're not supposed to be repetitive, or you shouldn't be repetitive, especially in the same paragraph. Um, right, and I'm, I'm totally guilty of using the thesaurus. I'm, I won't I a, a, a fancier word, but I will look for an alternate word. I do, too. I look, okay. for, I look mm-hmm. for a word that isn't fancy. I'll take a fancy right. word. And I'll, I'll yeah. look at, at the thesaurus to find something that I can use mm-hmm. that is more under understandable. Yeah, I've done the same thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I could, I mean, I really relied on mine very heavily when I was writing. As a matter of fact, um, 
I could not have done the book the way I did without a thesaurus, and I didn't use the one online. I have like the old-fashioned one that has every word in the English language in it, because I, I mean, it was is wonderful, and um, I, I mean, I, I couldn't have made it with without it. So, um, you know. Well, since we're talking about conversational writing, I'm going to tell you something here. Here's something you probably didn't know. Most people read at the the eighth grade level. That means if you yeah. want to keep most of your readers' attention, you should not write as if you're trying to impress a college professor. Did James, right? the, fifth, the, right. the, American, the American public is the fifth grade level. <laughs> that's what's really? told me today, yeah. yeah, yeah. It is wow. fifth grade. That's, that's one of the things I use. I was getting ready to say that, too. When I was writing, I, I, the average, now not everybody, some is way up, some is way, you know, way down. But the average American reads at a fifth grade level. Yeah, so I think that we always have to keep that in mind when we're writing something. So, you know, I, I agree with you in a way, Judy. If, if you have some word that's just preposterous to understand, <laughs> <laughs> you know, get the thesaurus out and try and dumb it down a little bit. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Um, I did but, it a lot. Yeah. A couple of years ago when I was working at, at Caesars, uh, some book came out and evidently the word plethora was in this book like 400,000 times. And so everybody in the office was reading this book, which I didn't read at the time. And so every day somebody would come in, they'd say, so what's new? And she says, oh, plethora of things, you know. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it got to be a joke. And I had to read a, a, a a legal document one time and the word porosity was there and so when somebody asked me what was going on I says well everything's just porosity <laughs> full of holes <laughs> and then well, that's like, what the legal, the legal documents are full of words that you're not supposed to understand Dan, right so. right yeah. <laughs> yeah and then they're probably going who told you that word Dan <laughs> <laughs> all right Dana I'm gonna go to the segment called Dana's two cents worth what do you have for us today Dana uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, come on, Dana. She's got a penny, Jane. She's got a what penny is happening to the show today? <laughs> <laughs> I um, no, I mean this, this is one of my favorite topics. Writing conversation is, I mean, that's what I do, and it's, it's fun for me because I usually wind up interviewing the person I'm ghostwriting for and get a sense of their voice. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just really important that people that are writing, you know, a memoir, um. Because conversationally, I think of a memoir more than, I mean, fiction, you can really do whatever you want, depending on your, your audience. But um, I just feel like, you know, people have to be honest about who they are and be willing to project that out there rather than trying to look, maybe they, they feel like they should look more intelligent or, you know, it's, it's a confidence thing too. You want your, you don't want to hold back. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're, if you're writing about your story, you want your voice to come through. And if you're hiring a ghostwriter, you want to make sure they're capturing your voice. Mm -hmm. right. You want it to sound like you, you know. Right. So I, I think that's really difficult sometimes. I mean, it, it's really hard. You do have to become that person. You really have to put your mind in inside their mind and figure out what it is they're trying to say. And I'm finding this true with what we're working on. We're talking about Gwen's book. You know, Gwen did a great job with her book, but there were times when, and and actually, I was noticing what you had edited today a little bit, Dana. There were questions you had. It actually made sense to me what she wrote, but then I realized to you, oh, wait a minute, you know, and then I started thinking about what you wrote. I'm thinking, that's right. The reader's not going to understand this because I understood a little bit of the medical stuff that mm -hmm. she was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we do have to be careful making sure that we convey it in a way and get inside the mind of, of, of the person who wrote it. Keeping their voice is so hard, though, sometimes. Well, right yeah. now I'm reading On Two Fronts, and that's, it's written conversationally as well, mm -hmm. and most of it. And uh, and it's two separate people having a conversation to themselves and, and writing it down. It, it's really, it's, it's very interesting. Hmm. Very interesting. I, I never laughed and cried so hard in my entire life as through this book. It's, it's hysterical. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Dana. What were you saying? No, no, no. No, not at all. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's just a matter of, like... Like I said, well, it's also a matter of knowing your audience. Like I just finished a book for an attorney, um, and he's he's writing a book on wills and trusts because that's his specialty. But he wanted it to be very conversational. He did not want it to be preachy or boring. 
he is basically like, understand what will happen if you pass away without a will. You know, um, you, you, the people that you want to get your money might not get it. And he, he wanted to write on a very conversational level, a very easy to understand level. So like, that's when I pulled out the, the story too, because there was sometimes there was, there was legal terminology that I wanted to put it in layman's terms. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and he's an, I mean, and he's just a really down to earth guy. And obviously he knows his business, and I'm sure he could walk into a court. And use, you know, ten dollar words until the cows come home. But he you know, he wanted it to be as if he was sitting down with a client and explaining it to them so that they can understand it and not feel, you know, confused or that they might be taken advantage of or whatever. So that was that was what he wanted for his book, which I thought was very cool. Yeah. And you, you also did an edit for uh, we had a, a guest on the show who wrote a physics book. Mm -hmm. Right. That and was well, that was a little <laughs> I mean, Keenan, he's, he's, he's awesome, awesome. Um, I didn't touch the physics. Okay. Like, I, I mean, he knows that. I mean, I didn't play around with any equations or any of that. It was just his narrative, which was a lot of fun. And that was also very down to earth, too. Right. Um, and that's what I'm saying. You, know, you actually took a yeah. uh, physics book that someone could take and possibly understand if you're studying mm -hmm. physics. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was actually, I, I, that was a fun book to edit. And I mean, I am not a physics person in any way, shape, or form. I it was actually I was laughing out loud. I mean, he 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 did a really good job on that. Yeah, I would tell any college freshman to to get that book. Well, I think we've pretty much covered the gambit on writing conversationally. I think that you know this turned out to be pretty good. <laughs> <Even Yeah. if laughs> we weren't here. Um, I know I learned a lot. So what's interesting to note is that we write every day like this and. Didn't I just didn't know that there was a name for it. I just called it writing. So. Right. right. <laughs> um, so, Judy, what's your next yes. book? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What is your next book going to be? Well, my next book is going to be about my uh, maternal side of my family. Uh, my great-great-grandmother was a Chippewa, and my great-great-grandfather was a Scotch Irish Virginia horse breeder. So I've, I've got some researching to do, and I'm also going to bring my coal mine uh, childhood into it. Mm. Um, yeah, so, but I haven't started yet. You know, I, I'll be truthful. I don't know if I have another book in me. It's, it's hard to write yeah. a book. It's hard. <laughs> so I got, I'm doing the research, but it hasn't. Um, uh, I'm more into writing articles now. I yeah. Know. That seems to be you know, something. Uh, I have a magazine in California that, um, that that published some articles, and I hadn't sent anything, and they emailed me and told me, "When are you going to send some more articles?" So, uh, but I'm in. I'm more into that now than uh, than I am. But I'm still researching. Well, we're we're heading into the last couple minutes of the show, so I'd like to thank Judy McFadden for joining us. And Judy, tell everyone about your book briefly. My book is Life with Macbeth, Lessons Learned from a Therapy Dog. Okay. And then we had Don Lewis Barnhart who joined us, who was in television for 40 years as a director of, like, Mark and Mindy, Say by the Bell, and uh, a couple dozen other things. Just look him up online yeah. and find out all the stuff. And hopefully we'll have Dr. Elspeth Muth and Freddie Zintel Weaver on again, um, or on. Um, our next live broadcast will be Tuesday, February 11th. For our guest sign-up, please visit our website at www.aspectsofwriting.com. Aspects of Writing broadcast live every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time here on KLEV, 1230 on the AM dial. On computer, you can listen to this broadcast live at www.klev1230am.com. This show rebroadcasts on VegasAllNetRadio.com every Friday at 5 o'clock p.m., so please visit the website to view our show and date and time. Um, our past shows are also archived on VegasAllNetRadio.com. Uh, to view the recorded version of this show, go to YouTube.com forward slash, forward slash Aspects of Writing on your computer. This show will be posted immediately after this podcast. So until next time, this is your host, James Kelly, reminding you, if you can dream it, you can write it. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Dana. Thank You're you, welcome. Dan. Thank you. All right. Thank you.